Welcome to the Race Guru Thunder Hour. I'm Rich Mileto. You can find me on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, at Fantasy Bosco. As always, I'm joined by the one, the only, the legend, the man, the myth, the man the, with the magic behind the curtain. Sean Angle, you can find on Twitter, at Sean E247. Remember, we spell that S-E-A-N around here. Hey, Jeff, give you some nice shout outs on the one man's opinion, giving you some hat tips, giving us some hat tips for the NASCAR stuff. So thank you, Mr. Mans. But uh, Sean really is the man behind the curtain that makes all this stuff go on. You see us on the coaching live stream. Sean's there, too. You see Jeff on one man's opinion. Sean's there. So if we're doing stuff online, on channels, everything else, you better believe Sean's a part of it. So hat tip to Mr. Sean. Hey, if you like what you hear from me and Sean on a weekly basis and some of the other guys on a daily basis, head over to FantasyGuru.com, hit the subscribe button, and you know what? I don't even know where our pricing is anymore. Uh, Jeff referenced that they extended some pricing through July. I'll be honest with you, all right? Here's the deal. I stand by our stuff here. If you want everything but football and baseball, for 40 bucks, it'll get you 12 months. It'll get you every sport from now till 2025 now and every sport in there that's not football and basketball. Uh, baseball, I'm sorry. Basketball is included, not baseball or football. Yeah. However, if you are a football fan like, I don't know, 80% of the American public, and you're signing up for one of our football packages, please, please do yourself a favor. Reach out to support at fantasyguru.com. Tell them what you're looking for. Last I heard on One Man's Opinion, which I did listen to the newest episode today, I believe Jeff was saying, for the price of what you're getting for football, if you reach out to support, they'll hook you up with a promo where you get the all-in package. It includes everything, the stuff we do with baseball and football for the total football package price. I, I honestly don't know what that pricing is, Sean. I have not looked. I will say you click the subscribe button. There's options there. And please reach out to support at Fantasy Guru. They will hook you up. I completely agree with Jeff. I have seen pricing for other, you know, competition. We're the most bang for the buck, man. I, I firmly believe that. I stand by our content. It's not just, and I guess I'm biased. I'm here, but holy <laughs> crap. MLB model, Chris Rose is killing baseball. I know the guys, Horry Pucks, and the guys killed hockey. Scott Bonder and Patio Joe are chiming in all over the place with great stuff. Football, I mean, we do our thing on football, Sean, you know this. And and yeah, to, to us, we've been getting it done on NASCAR, man, in racing. So yeah, come check we it have. out. On behalf of the Elite Plus platform of Fantasy Guru, this is the Race Guru Thunder Hour. Sean. What'd you think, man? We went street racing again. What do you got? So really, we got ourselves two races this past weekend. Let's let's go right into uh, our reactions for Chicago here. We had one race, which was a race that ended up being pretty good. I'd say it was for, it was a good race. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, it was a good race. One of the one of the better ones of the year so far overall. And then we had a race that. Well, let's just say I thought it wasn't going to be affected by rain, but I was way, way wrong about that one. So let's let's give a green flag and checkered flag to the Xfinity series, okay? The best racing we've seen, I think, on look, I'm I'm not gonna dog the street course. I have some issues, whatever. The course is the course, okay? Take all the rest of it out of it. As far as what we were seeing on the track, man. SVG, Larson, and Gibbs, they gave us a show. And, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention SVG is going cup next year. We know this. It's not official, but we know this is happening. Larson is already at the top of the, the cup series, leading points, even though he's missing races and crashing into walls. And Ty well, Gibbs we, is... I was going to say, regarding SVG, it hasn't been confirmed yet or anything like that. We just speculate that he's likely... In a slot for a track house let, cup ride there. Let me put it this way. My confidence level that it's going to happen, I would be willing to bet my nutsack that it happens. Okay. So in my mind, it's not official. I get it. And it's happening. My point being is we've got three cup drivers, cup level drivers and Xfinity equipment. And that's the best probably racing we've had in quite some time, specifically for sure at this street course. But oh, driver yeah. talent in the cars, man, it. That they put on a show. Hat tip to the entire series. Strategy was coming into play. They put on a show. They sure did. And really, 
you can go back and replay that whole first stage when Larson and SBG were especially going back and forth, passing each other, all for the lead there while they were still staying ahead of Ty Gibbs, who was close by, but in, in hot pursuit of those two. I mean, that was some of the best racing we've seen all year and really some of the best road course based racing out there that we've seen in quite some time. It, it, it's easy to just go back and look at that, replay it, and be like, wow, that was pretty awesome. It was some of the least shit show road racing we've had this year. Most of the road courses we've gone to has turned into some sort of debacle, whether it was late restarts running people over, whether it was bonehead moves in the middle of stages or at the end of stages. We didn't have a lot of that in the Xfinity. The Cup race, that was a different story. But in the Xfinity race, dare I say, that might have been one of the most professional road races we've seen run this year. Yeah, and in Xfinity history, I'd say also too. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree because Xfinity's never really been known for that. But no, I agree. And and I, to me, it's, it's something to be said when your top three drivers are full time Cup regular. Well, SVG will be, but I mean, he has won a Cup race already. It was this track, but he has already run a Cup race. Was one of the favorites for Sunday. Um, I, I I was impressed. I was impressed with Jesse Love. Um, yeah, that took RCR. The RCR for bringing the speed. Hills run well there. Austin Hills run well there, but the speed's been kind of missing the last few weeks from RCR. It seems like Jesse Love's background is not road racing. The young man's only 19 years old and doesn't really have any road racing background. And ever since Talladega, he's hit kind of a slump till the last two weeks. Road yeah. racing and oval. All of a sudden, Jesse, it's like it's like Jesse's love started to figure some things out. For sure. And you know what? Even though it was partially a strategy call that got him the finish that he got, got there, he still held his own there. He ended up being tied for the most laps led of all the drivers in this race. Yes. Yes, he did. And hat tip you, I did not realize that Big Red Machine with uh, Parker Kligerman was even affiliated with RCR. Um, yeah, had I know that, I might have pushed Parker. Yeah, I might have pushed because I was already high on Parker. I wrote him up in the article and pushed him pretty hard which I had done most of the year, but he's been good lately. He's been particularly good on the road courses. Had I known that the affiliation there and shame on me, um, I really would have pushed him even harder, but it, nice run by Parker Kligerman. He does well in these road courses. I mean, there's nothing surprising there. Um, Chevy, you, you said it best in our notes. Chevy came to play 13 of the top 15 finishers, Sean. Yeah. 13 of the top 15 were Chevy drivers in the Xfinity race, which I don't know if we've seen that kind of uh, domination between one manufacturer in many races like this, but it certainly happened this past weekend in the Xfinity race at Chicago there, there. In fact, we only saw Ty Gibbs, who finished second, and Joey Logano, who finished eighth for AM Racing. They were the only Toyota and Ford representatives in the entire top 15. All the other drivers, Chevrolet, 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 Chevrolet. It's insane. We've probably seen something like this in the truck series over the years, whether it's been Chevy or whether it's been Toyota. Um, but I'll be frank. I don't know. Man, even in my lifetime, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like that in Cup ever. I can't speak to the Bush series slash Xfinity series, you know, what we saw there. But that's it's pretty impressive. I mean, that, that it really is. Um, hey, SVG, he came to do what he was supposed to do, right? He sure did. He ended up wi winning. He led the most laps. He won the first stage. It's just about what we expected, considering that he's been, other than Coda, he's w dominated every road course event. And even at Coda, he could have e easily won that too, if not for a lap penalty on the last lap either, and getting into it with Austin Hill. Right. And hey, Austin Hill's getting it done. I mean, you know, everyone thinks of him as kind of a plate racer type. He's done well in these road courses. He won stage two. And, hey, I want to give a little shout-out to Joey Logano. For people that say it's all about the car, where is AM Racing finished with Haley Deegan behind the wheel? And where is – and, granted, this was a road course, so it's a little different. But we'll get another taste this weekend with Josh Berry on an oval. Driver matters. I I, I am a full agreement that the car matters and you got to have speed in the car. But I don't care how fast the car is. If you don't have a top-level driver, it's not going to top-level perform. And I'm not here to bash Haley Deegan, but – all I'm saying is some proof is in the pudding. You know, I, I've accused NASCAR and teams of chasing money and sponsors and not talent. 
and I get why they do it. I'm not a fan of it. I, I would much rather see talent win out. I feel like that's the root of sports, right? Level the playing field, see who's the best. Um, racing's a little different. Everyone's always kind of cheated and found an edge. I mean, that is what it is. But I still want to see the best talent out there. And I'm really curious to see where this number 15 AM racing team goes from this point forward. Well, they're a team that's still building up and they've gotten some new members on that team this year. They did a whole crew chief change in the middle of the year and the equipment. They have a technical alliance with Stuart Haas Racing in the Xfinity Series, but they're not getting, say, some of the best equipment because you, you we've regularly seen the RSS racing cars and the actual SHR cars themselves outperform AM racing every every week except for this week now now part of it could be because of road course and with the talent but that that, that number 15 has not even finished better than 12th and that was at a talateka this season this is and their that's first why top 10 all year and that's why i said talent matters i'm really curious because i have josh barry we know was a good xfinity driver otherwise he doesn't get a cup right but it's not fair to just look at this road or street course as you know an apples to apples comparison but I tell you what, man, if Josh Berry puts this car in the top 10 this week, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? I, it may not happen, but anyway, uh, as you pointed out, Jesse tied for the most in lap led, 14. SVG also had 14. Larson had 12. Hill had eight. And Sammy Smith, once again, quietly coming back into that top 10, top five performances after hitting that slump. He led That's another laps. young driver I got a lot of hope for, man. Led two laps. I'm pretty sure that was during one of the uh, breaks for caution, as it was, though. So Fair I don't enough. think it was but, under green, but I do But I do know he did lead two laps there. Everybody else led zero that we didn't mention, but we do have a bunch of standout finishers. So uh, let's quickly go through some of our, uh, our th some of the ones you want to point out here, Rich. Uh, start us off here. Well, got to give a hat tip to Connor Mozak. Not surprised. Pushed him pretty hard in the article. Driving the 88, road racing background. It's a stock car racing, but it is a road racing background. Um, not shocked. Kind of curious to see what he does this week in trucks. He'll be in the number seven. Uh, Allgaier, I think he was hoping for a little more. Uh, Josh Williams, first top 15 since Portland. I don't, you know, he's kind of a short tracker. The fact that he's doing so well in these road courses is kind of interesting. But here again, he is racing for a team that has two outstanding road course racers and knows exactly how to build or what they need in a fast car and how to drive road courses. So that Josh Williams apparently can learn because that's that's pretty impressive. The only top 15s or so far two of the top 15s have been at road courses. Uh, Kyle Weatherman, that was another nice finish from him. First top 15 since Charlotte. Uh, Jeb Burton, nice 15th place finish there. You know, Brandon Jones was running better, man. I know he came back in 17th. That's an improvement from where he started. But quite frankly, he was top 10 for a good chunk of that event. Cole Custer. Yeah. I didn't see that coming. Especially the man. guy that led every lap last year. And uh, he ends his streak, too, of uh, five consecutive top 10 finishes going into this past weekend, too. And really here to round out the, the back of the field, Sam Mayer, 19th, Brennan Poole, 20th, John Hunter Nemechek, 25th, Sheldon Creed, 26th, Daniel Soares, 27th, Riley Oof. Herbst, Riley Herbst, 20th. none of these, none of these guys. I pushed Poole in the article. Uh, John Hunter got a shout out. Creed got a shout out. Mayor was pushed a bit in the article. These guys all typically run well on road courses and they did not perform well this weekend. They certainly did not. But did you point out about Austin Green? I did. I did, and I forgot to mention him here. I did push Austin Green as a sweet value, and he got it done in 10th place. I, this kid, he still finds he ways to find yeah. his way into the, either the top 15 or top 10 of these road courses. He's in the third Jordan Anderson racing car. He's making them look really good. You got to remember, he finished top five at Walk at uh, Sonoma yes, as well. So Yes, he did. We have to well, that was the reason I was pushing him. Starts. I was doing my little sorting by road courses. And I'm like, wait, 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 what now? Because normally in the overview article, I already have kind of that stuff built in there. And I didn't mention green in the overview article. 
I don't, I couldn't recall the finish from Sonoma. So as I'm going back and looking, I'm like, holy crap, this guy does nothing but finish like in the top 10 when he's in the road course cars. And he doesn't, doesn't get a lot of opportunities on ovals. I would love to see, I mean, for a guy to do this with Jordan Anderson equipment, I would love to see this guy get some other opportunities on some ovals, kind of like we've seen with SVG. Let's see what this young man's he got. He's going to get some uh, later this year. He's got, got, I believe, two or three starts on ovals as well as another okay. road course event. So there Good you deal. go. Good deal. And then we get to the cup race. All right. So before we get to the cup race, green flag, checker flags for Xfinity. NASCAR, I'm giving you a black flag. We ran into issues last year. Your solution, yeah, we'll move everything up a half hour. What's a half hour? You delayed this race for over an hour. Some of it was due to puddles. You have rain tires. When I saw the start, because I turned, Sean, we do these so often, and I fill out the articles earlier in the week, and I forget. I overlap times. So I'm sitting here thinking at 2.30 my time, we're going to see the Chicago race start. So I've got the TV on. I've got other things going, and I'm hearing pre-race, and I'm hearing singing. and I'm like, man, did they have a delay? Like, what's going on? And then the dogs out come in, thinking green flags should be flying. Uh, now I hear we do have a delay. And I go and I look at the start time, and I'm like, really? That was the local start time that you wanted for this event that you had to cut short last year? And, oh, by the way, NASCAR shortened both races, laps and miles. So we already went less from last year and moved up the start times, and it wasn't, it wasn't even close to enough. I do have to say this one thing regarding the start time. They didn't say this on the broadcast itself, but there was actually a valid reason for why the race started a little bit later than it was expected. And that's just because there was actually protesters trying to climb their way into the track oh, there. Jesus. Okay. But that doesn't, so, that doesn't absolve them from starting the race say, at two 30 versus I want to say it was five o'clock Eastern was the drop of the green flag time schedule roughly around then i do okay. know that part of the whole other reasoning was because of broadcasting schedule nbc was trying to broadcast the whole uh indy car race before this cup race as well and that was at 1 30 so that also conflicted with the time frame i am sure of that too but that's even fair, so i would say that's a fair point but but sean i go back to when is nascar going to start to learn from mistakes We've got topics coming up that we talked about off air. And look, it was, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that you have no lights. You can't run it the following day. You've already had to shorten it when you thought the original distance was adequate. It's not a long race, Sean. I mean, I don't know what the actual race time was, but that Xfinity event was what, less than two hours? Somewhere around those lines. And at the very least, they did do this compared to last year. They at least gave the whole time indication of yes. when the race was going to end, which they they gave the teams enough notice so they could strategize around it, unlike last year, where that basically took the race out of some team's hands, like Christopher Bell's last well, year. Yeah. And credit to where credit you is due. Him. NASCAR at least learned with that. But even so, even so uh, the conditions... That were displayed yeah like you said they can learn and to make some better decisions with that too it, both both the I, all i know is when i went back and looked at start times my first thought was who was brilliant idea was it to start both the xfinity and the cup races so late because and, and i understand there's a lot of moving pieces but here's the deal your goal when you run a race as a sanctioning body is to set up a race for success, right? You have put all this money and effort into having the Chicago skyline and everything behind it, and you have been so inept, we have yet to get a complete Chicago race. And, and don't just blame the weather. Starting as late as you did is partly why the weather has been a bigger factor. It's summertime in the Midwest, man. Pop-up showers happen. They happen a lot. It's just, it, it's the nature of the beast. I, I've lived in the Midwest my whole life. Well, mostly. And even in the Southeast, it's the same way. You get near the coast, eight months out of the year, it rains every day. So, I don't know. Anyway, the race itself, Kyle Larson makes things interesting. You know I'm a Kyle Larson fan. Maybe if SVG doesn't get bumped into by Chase Briscoe, and please, folks, stop the Chase Briscoe hate. He obviously lost control. He wasn't trying to ruin SVG's, you know, back-to-back -back run. 
Yeah, he just lost control. That was at the point when uh, just before they they decided the to delay the race due right. to the uh, puddles causing visibility issues with the drivers. Yeah, and I tell you what, if you go back and look at some of the in car cams, yeah, the my wife because I don't like to use windshield wipers. I hate it. I'll wax the windshield, rain X stuff like that, and it kind of beads off. The wife hates it. How can you see? I see just fine. I'm telling you, bro, that stuff would have had me puckered up. Like, go <laughs> look. And I've raced on dirt where you don't see very well. You do have to kind of go by feel and memory and things like that. Dude, those in-car camps are gnarly. Like, there was not a lot of vision on a couple of the turns. It'd be fine in some spots, and then you'd make the turn, and it was blind. You, all you saw was flashing reds from the lights that were on the back of the cars, and you couldn't even really place the distance they were at. Yeah, absolutely crazy. You know, you bring up the uh, subject of of uh, Shane Van Gisberg and SVG wrecking out in the race. He was one of a couple of drivers that ended up having to deal with some incidents or just completely wrecked out that had their race ruined. So let's go through the uh, list here real quick. Uh, Denny Hamlin finished 30th. Chase Briscoe, as mentioned, he ended up finishing 32nd. Truex ended up finishing 33rd. Josh Berry ended up crashing out, being the last driver to basically score a DNF in 36th. Christopher Bell, who looked very strong in a couple points of this race, ended up crashing out in 37th. AJ Allmendinger, we know the Dinger is great at road courses. He was trying to go forth and catch the drivers for the lead. He ended up finishing 38th. Larson. And that ended wasn't up, his fault. Yeah. He got ran over. Mm hmm. Larson, he ended up in 39th after just crashing Boy, straight that. into the tires. He buried, man. he buried that into the tires, man. <laughs> because you hear the crew chief, hey, make you pull it out. And Steve Latart's going, eh, ain't no fixing this guy. Nope. And then SVG for hit, like you said. And the thing was, the beginning part of the race, SVG and Larson and even Dinger as he was coming up, there was some great racing to start off with. It, it'd been nice if we had started an hour and a half earlier, would have gotten some of it in. I really didn't think we were going to get as much rain as we did. I was with you. Interestingly enough, the perfect DFS lineup was basically a lineup with a whole bunch of money left over like a plate race. Yeah, absolutely crazy in that regard. But, you know, we still haven't even talked about, about the top finishers up front. Alex Ooh. Bowman won. He did. He did. And he runs well at the race we're or at the track we're going to. He's been a better road racer. I mean, he's finished top 10, top 15 type of stuff. He earned it. Denny Hamlin said it best on his pod. I think it was his pod or his interview. Bowman earned that win. Um, I know Bubba can be mad. I think personally Bowman was too hard on himself with the Bubba incident. I give him a hat tip for taking the high road, saying I don't want anything to happen to Bubba and, and trying to move on. And the fact he tried to reach out to Bubba under the delay, under the red flag delay, and called him. Uh, Bubba, grow up. I want to be a fan, and you make it nearly impossible to be a fan. Grow up and quit acting like a baby. We know you have mental challenges. You're open about that. I appreciate that. But you got to start toughing up and getting your shit figured out because I'm a little over the whiny baby stuff. But, you know, uh, Bubba's 2311 teammate, he ended up making a run for the win as well. He, he Tyler did. Reddick ended up finishing second and at one point looked like he was going to catch Bowman. But then he got into the wall there on the last lap and just did not have the car in order to get there. Ty Gibbs ended up finishing behind Reddick in third. So Ty Gibbs ended up having a really great weekend overall did you happen to see the interview with reddick again this week yeah he was <laughs> bummed out once again for a guy that's been coming to back-to-back -back top fives and equipment that he's openly admitted he doesn't feel is up to snuff my lord is he so depressed someone get him some prozac or uh uh Hoktua or something man i, I don't know because the <laughs> poor guy I have never seen someone with such finishes. I mean, he's not being a poor sport about it, but good Lord, man. he It's like someone just kicked his dog. I mean, come on. And, hey, I don't want to bury the lead here. Hat tip Joey Hand. Great find Brad Keselowski. Great job putting him in the car. He did win stage two. He led for some laps. Uh, led seven laps to be precise. 
uh, I was impressed with what we saw from Joey Hand. So a hat tip to him. Yeah, he he ended up fourth. He was actually the top four driver in the entire race. So if anybody was lucky enough in order to set a bet on him to be the top four driver, they won big this past weekend there because those odds were definitely long indeed. Had to be like plus 5,000 or something. Yeah, at the very least. Also, uh, about Bowman's win, he ended up breaking a winless streak of 80 races, and now he becomes the sixth driver this year to break a winless streak of 40-plus races. So, for context of why I bring that up, Rich, though, is because we're actually one away from tying the record all-time in the Cup Series of that. Interesting. Well, we're always, with, with this new car, I can't lie. Although I will say it's, it's fun for the first time in two years since the new car's been launched that we don't have everybody clamoring going, are we going to get 16 winners? What if we get 16 winners? Oh my God, we're going to get 16 winners. Hasn't really happened. Um, multiple winners in racing or multiple wins for one team in racing. It's a thing. It happens. Um, you find stuff, you find stuff that's clicking, you find ways to work with the tires. So uh, I'm glad that's not been the issue, but Hey, congrats to Bowman. He earned it. You know, he did. And I tell you what, it's going to be the Hendrick JGR show come the end of the year, isn't it? It sure is more than likely, especially when you see at the top. Really, it's just Hendrick and JGR cars at the top of the points, with one exception being Tyler Reddick, who's now third in points. And this is Mr. The, Depressed. Yeah. He's now in the highest position in points ever by a 2311 car since the team's inception. Oh, well, congrats to them. It, I just, you know, if you're Hendrick, you got to love where you're sitting right now because now you have the luxury of testing out a lot of things on this car because all four of your drivers, for the most part, I mean, technically we could get 16 winners and see someone knocked out, but the way they run on a points basis, all four Hendrick drivers are in the championship playoffs right now, or in the playoffs, I should say. Yeah, although uh, I do have to wonder, though, uh if that's going to basically haunt us for DFS the next couple of weeks until the playoffs begin though. <laughs> well, it could, cause, cause it, I will not be shocked if the Hendrick drivers are test. And here's where it's going to be difficult. They're probably going to be testing some things, playing with some things. They're probably going to hit and they're probably going to miss. And we're going to have to get lucky <laughs> when they hit or fade when they don't and hope we get lucky that way. With all four of them. And that could be why we've seen some of the struggles with William Byron right now. I mean, you go back two months ago, they were by far, I mean, they were doing better than the five. They were doing better than the nine. They were at the top of the field with everybody. And they've been in a bit of a slump. Even though the speed has been there, some of it's just been things outside of the team and driver's control. Um, I'm just kind of curious to see how this play out. Because we, look, historically we saw this with Jimmy Johnson. Win early, get a nice lead. And then there was like a midsummer slump. And then we get to the playoffs and it's like, oh my gosh, they just hit a switch and they're fast again. So look, Chad Knauss has had a competition. Chad Knauss was the crew chief. So like you said, this could haunt us for DFS because we're going to be playing a guessing game. But I firmly believe we're going to see, I won't be shocked if we see two Hendrick cars near the front, two Hendrick cars near the rear or in the middle or something like that, at least over the next three, four races. Yeah, I certainly think that can be the case. Although this weekend it might be be a track we know Hendrick is good at, so right, they'll definitely be in the conversation. But I want to quickly put a bow on this race. Go through a few more notes in here. Uh, Front Row Motorsports had a great day at Chicago. Michael McDowell finished fifth. Todd Gillen finished seventh. Chase Elliott, speaking of Hendrick, had his top twenty streak finally end due to to get bullshit. contact and issues with Daniel bullshit. Suarez. Sorry, that was bullshit. And now Todd Gilliland has the longest active top 20 streak in the Cup Series right now. This is his ninth top 20 finish in a row there, Rich. Actually hey, impressive. I, I, I wrote him up in the article that's dropping later tonight. I'm with you, Sean. I was slow to the Todd Gilliland party. I really was. I liked him coming up. I did. It's not like I have anything against the guy. I just never felt like the equipment's there. The equipment's finally there. And if you were to hold a gun to my head, give me Todd Gillen over Michael McDowell nine out of ten times. Todd's even ahead of Michael in points right now, too. And actually, 
low key in the conversation. If a lot of these drivers on the playoff bubble have trouble, he could get himself into the points conversation right there. He's just, and you like know, David outside of that, his dad was very similar. Got you solid finishes. It's a shame when his dad drove for basically a same tier. It may have been the same company I'm trying to remember now, but it was definitely similar tier or what was a similar tier. He still pulled out a win at the, at the other day. We've seen guilt that we've seen both Todd and, and David run well at the big plate tracks. Um, but I think this is, we've seen more from Todd than we really ever did from David. And I thought David was a pretty solid racer. Frankly, I'm glad David's still in the ownership side of things. Cause it, I think it's great that we got a couple of Gillilands and NASCAR. There's not, they may be a little boring at times, but they speak their mind when asked. And quite frankly, they're not a bunch of dirty jerk off racers. So I, I'm glad to see it. Now I'm going to go through just some, just to finish putting a bow on this race, some uh, standout finishers there. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. with a sixth place run. William Byron finished eighth, as we know. Kyle Busch scored the ninth place finish, his first top 10 since Kansas in early May. Finally, he's back in the top 10. Uh, we have Daniel Suarez in 11th, Daniel Hemrick in 12th. Bubba Wallace still ended 13th. Noah Gregson was the only Stuart Haas racing driver to not have trouble in this race. Ended 14th. Austin Sindrick 15th. The free square Justin Haley ended up 16th. And give a hat tip to Zane Smith in 17th. His fourth top 20 finish in the last six races now. He is on, He is back to rising up a little bit finally. We've been waiting on and that. And he's cheap there. this week. He He's someone we might want to keep in mind for this week because he's doing double duty. So um, good shout out there. Uh, like you said, Chase, Chase struggled. Hey, did you, because I pushed Kaz Grala in the overview article. Did you push him as well since he qualified 40th? He wasn't my top push, but I did say that he was not a bad call overall as well in discord. Cause so. he was cheap. He was the second, yeah. he was either second or the cheapest on the slate at like 5,100 starting 40th. That's one of those examples in DFS where you kind of take that and that gives you so much freedom with the rest of your lineup. For sure, for sure. And he ended up having a good place differential day. He wasn't the top place differential play of the week. That was Joey Hand by far. <laughs> I mean, he was also one we pushed, though. So, I mean, yeah. if you went with Hand and Kaz, and Hand's price was a little higher. But if you went with Hand and Kaz, you got, what, collectively somewhere around 80 points between the two of them? something along those lines, but hand, he went all the way from starting 38th to finishing fourth and getting some laps led in there too. That is a right. big, big day. So, I mean, just on place differential, not their, their points. Okay. He moved up 30 some, uh, Kaz group moved up 14. So there's 44 points, just a place differential, a top 25 ish. I think pays somewhere in 15 in points. I want to say something like that. And then, of course, a top five or top six finish, that puts you just short of 40 points, 38 or so. So, yeah, collectively, the two, if you had those two in your lineup, Sean, that was 80 to 90 points you got, man. Yeah. And the crazy thing is both drivers were under 7K on DK. Right. That's what I mean. I mean, it was cheap. You could put them in there for cheap. So um, I had one lineup with both. Unfortunately, the rest of the lineup sucked. It had a bunch of negative points in it. Um, and yet it still managed to be one of the few lineups that cashed. But it was just kind of it was kind of interesting because two guys I felt really, really good about looking back. If I just would have had enough balls to do basically lineups based with those two guys and started mixing and matching thereafter, my gosh, Sean, we could have just been raking in money. Yeah, we certainly could have. But, you know, that puts a wrap on this race. Uh, let's get into some new stories here real quick. Let's get the uh, big silly season one out of the way here first. Noah Gregson joining Front Row Motorsports in 2025. So that leaves three of the four Stuart Haas racing drivers with rides for next year now that Noah is joining Front Row. So quick synopsis and thoughts here, Rich. Not shocked. We said this last week. We expected it. We've just been waiting for the official news. Good on Noah, especially since this team has been doing better. And poor Noah, apparently I read an article today that back in 2023, he was about to give up on racing to go do landscaping or build pools. Great. You know, it's just goes to show if you work at it, you put put the 
put it all together, get our lives at the right people. He's built his career back up, and now he's joining a Tier 1 Ford team next year with Front Row, so that's already a big deal. Let me throw in a few additional notes here uh, that came out as a result of the announcement. Uh, Gregson's car number, crew chief, and sponsors are to be announced, but Gregson's crew chief is not expected to be Travis Peterson. You know, the current crew chief of the number 34. He's expected to join Michael McDowell at Spire when he leaves for there next year. And Gregson, this contract with Front Row is a multi-year deal. And that Bob Jenkins, during the announcement, he said said regarding the third car that the team is overall going to be made up of three young drivers next year. So this we can safely say that this eliminates Ryan Priest from the Front Row conversation overall. Really? I mean, I would consider him a young driver. I do think he's eliminated. I'm not disputing that, but I think he's a young driver. I see you got Christian Eckes noted, not Riley Herbst. Well, this is based on recent discussion and murmurings around the internet and the garage and from what reporters have been saying, that the last front row ride is expected to be between Sam Mayer, Zane Smith, and Christian Eckes. And especially, I want to mention Zane Smith in particular. Just just because of the fact that the matter was, was that during that same announcement, one of the uh, the higher members of staff up at Front Row was actually talking a lot about Zane Smith to reporters, in particular giving a lot of praise and saying that the team still believes in him, and if they could get him back, they would. So I think really well, think that this whole conversation regarding this third Front Row car is just going to hinge on the fact of uh, Trackhouse's decision on their third, third team for next year, if they're going to do SBG or if they're going to do Zane. Well, and I got to believe, I, I'm, I'm confident they go SVG, and I got to believe if I'm front row, I want Zane. Zane. Let's not forget, Zane won front row a truck championship just two years ago. Three. Two or three years ago. It's been very recent. He's a Ford guy until, you know, he got this cup opportunity. I think he'd be, and, and really, when Zane stepped up in the front row equipment last year as kind of a trial run, he did decent. I mean, he did better than I expected. So, I, I hope it's... Sam Mayer deserves a shot. I want to see Mayer stay with Chevy, though. So selfishly, I'm hoping Mayer gives it one more year in Xfinity um, and makes a, you know goes out and tries to make a real dominant type of performance in Xfinity, like we've seen with some other previous champions. I would love to see Zane Smith back with front row. Hey, Eckes, I like you, dude. You got to earn some stripes in my book, though, bud. Just you're, you're close, but it pains me to see your name ahead of Heim right now, buddy. Just saying. Well, Heim is already in the Toyota system, so he's going right. to be in a Toyota ride. And 2311 have admitted that he's their driver of the future that they're looking to put in a car eventually. they The whole conversation around Heim is just if they can get enough sponsorship lined up for him or if they're going to leave him down in an Xfinity or trucks for one more year just to give him enough time to eventually take that third 2311 car. I'd boot Daniel Suarez first, although that's track house. That's track house. track house. Entirely different team. I get why do I do that with 2311 at track house? Like literally those two, I get twisted up every single time. So all right, I'll rephrase that. Boot Bubba and put Hyman. That's where I'm at. They won't do it. They won't do it. Bubba comes with too much sponsorship and and he's got too much everything else around him that goes with it. But I'll I'll go this far and say it. When all is said and done and careers are over with, Corey Heim will dwarf the career of Bubba Wallace. Well, you know, if Heim ever gets to Cup Series and we see this happen, we should clip this to, just to go back on it one day to see if this actually happens. So we'll and remember that. I'll put my future. money where my mouth is, Sean. I, you know me. I've been pushing this Heim kid for a few couple of years now. I mean, I have really been beating this drum. I want him in a Cup ride. ASAP. I want him and Ty Gibbs competing against each other as soon as humanly possible. Okay. We need this in NASCAR. It needs to happen. Bubba, I ain't got time for your whiny brat. I don't. I'm done with it, man. I stop talking, start racing well, and I'll re I'll reevaluate. But he, he doesn't. Corey Heim has got more talent in one pinky toe than Bubba Wallace has in a whole foot. Hmm. Well, shots fired, but you know what? We'll see how the future plays out because we don't know what, who's in that tw- third 2311 seat just yet. 
and uh, who that they're putting in. Right now, we know that it's probably between Riley Herbst and Corey Heim, as it is. Herbst for the sponsorship reasons, but I think pretty sure the team prefers talent-wise to have Heim in the car, of course. So, And you know what's interesting? Both Eckes and Herbst have the same sponsor. You know what Very I mean? Interesting. It's just funny. <laughs> We're talking about them having opportunities, and we know sponsorship's a big deal, and they both have the same sponsorship. Monster, yeah, why did you uh, sign Heim? The terrible Herps sponsorship, right? Yes. I thought he had Monster. I thought Herps also had Monster. Herps is Monster. Uh, what's his? Uh, Eckes doesn't have Monster. Oh, I thought Eckes did have Monster. My bad. My apologies. I thought Eckes was also Monster for some reason. But he's not. You're right. That's not a green and black truck, 98. That would be the green and black car, 98. That truck is the number 19. So my apologies, Mr. Christian Eckes. There you go. All right, let's quickly go through a few more of these. Uh, NASCAR, they have announced that they're allowing teams to use both regular and option tires for the Richmond race next month. We talked about this just before we got onto the show. I know this makes you really heated up, Rich, <laughs> because it's North <laughs> Wilkesboro all over again. But I... <laughs> I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna refrain from saying much of anything other than boo typical NASCAR, whatever. Prove me wrong, NASCAR. Show me a good race at Richmond. Prove me wrong. Well, we shall see, but at least the interesting thing is is that NASCAR is saying that they're gonna allow the teams in order to basically have the option that choose either the regular or the option tires throughout the whole race. So this should, should be something very interesting to watch to see how teams approach the race when it comes time for Richmond. But you know what? We still have a month before that happens, so we shall see. Like I Let's, said, I won't be shocked if we get some sort of renig on that. And like I won't, I won't be shocked if something happened mid-race for that to happen. Then again, to your point, Sean, it may rain, and we may not even talk about the stupid option tires anyway. Yeah, because then it'll simply be regular option or wet tires. <laughs> so, anyway, so I've I've reconsidered my stance on the whole Rodney Childers deal. Okay, Spire getting Rodney Childers to crew chief the seventeen for Corey LaJoy in twenty twenty five. That's your context. Now we get go. <laughs> I was very disappointed in it. Um, I'd like to see chemistry and continuity with drivers and crew chief. I feel like Josh Berry was young. He's definitely more of a student of the game, takes some time. This was a great fit for him. I am not going to accuse Rodney of chasing money. I'm not going to accuse Barry of chasing money. I'm just disappointed that was the case. Where I'm more disappointed, no disrespect to Corey LaJoy, because frankly, I don't know if you've ever heard his radio show on Sirius. He does a phenomenal job. He is a student of the sport. I really like Corey LaJoy. That said, Corey LaJoy, I do not think you are Kevin Harvick level. I think I'm not sure you're Josh Berry level. I'm glad you get a good crew chief. It's my understanding Rodney Childers wanted to go to Spire because Spire, for lack of a better term, is poaching a lot of the SHR employees. And Rodney wants to have some continuation with who he's worked with. From a manager standpoint, an employee boss type of standpoint, I applaud Rodney Childers for that. That is a good way to help Spire grow. And Spire came on record on air, I believe, with Daniel Trotta. And said, look, when we grew from 30 employees or 40 employees to 130 employees, it was just a struggle to try to get it figured out. Now they have the luxury, if you will, to really start sorting through some talent and creating the type of foundation they want. I will be the first to admit Rodney Childers is an excellent cornerstone to build off of, much like Hendrick did with Chad Knauss. I won't be shocked to see Rodney Childers to kind of go the same route that Chad Knauss did. And this is great for Spire. I don't think it's obviously it doesn't do anything for this year, Sean. But I got to tell you, we had high hopes for Spire this year. And we've been kind of let down, even at the truck level. Other than I Carson Hosefar. True. That, good point on Carson Hosefar. He has been kind of getting it done when no one else has, right? I have really high expectations for next year. And frankly... I wouldn't mind seeing Rodney Childers with Carson Hosevar over Corey the Joy. I think that would be a very interesting combo as well. I, I do like the idea of that, but you know, pressure's going to be on Corey next year. He's got all the tools in place. Spire has money. Spire's giving him a great crew chief. He's got to go out there and perform now. They, 
that. I don't think there's much more excuses you can make if you don't perform next year. We're getting the growing pains out this year because Spire just expanded the three cars. Now you're going to have a second year with the three cars under your belt. And you're also going to have a, a veteran teammate with Michael McDowell also coming in. So right there, you got all the different tools. Spire, I'm I'm going to say they should they better take a step up next year. Otherwise, this is going to be a well, really disappointing call. It is. It is. And, and I do. And I got to wonder what kind of management role beyond just being a crew chief Rodney Childers has or what they've discussed, because Rodney was very adamant. He wanted to continue working with some of the same folks. Right. So he sees something there with those folks and people. Rick Hendrick will tell you it's all about the people. Right. So I can I can get on board with that. Dare I say in two years that number seven might be the one one of the most desired ride rides in NASCAR. There's potential I mean, there. I mean, we got a we got, a lot's got to happen, but I'm just saying, range of outcomes. That's completely plausible, in my opinion, Sean. Indeed, it can be. So, we touched on this next one earlier. We got the NASCAR penalty report there. Really, this is just a whole bunch of headlines that just get rich heated up. <laughs> I don't. Well, I, didn't even, I, I, I just want some consistency. <laughs> If you're going to take points yes, from Josevar, yes. take points from Bubba, okay? Well, Josevar hooked him. I didn't see it as a hook. I saw him hit him in the corner. It's not like he came down and swiped him. He hit him too hard. I, I don't have in, in-car cam of Harrison Burt, but I bet his hands came off the steering wheel. That's the whole reason, supposedly, you know, Bubba's in-car cam and Bowman's in-car cam showed a pretty, you know, blatant hit. NASCAR doesn't want to take Bubba's points. Let's be honest about this, Sean. NASCAR doesn't want to take Bubba's points away because of the way he sits in the points battle right now. So we go back to lack of consistency. And, Sean, you and I talked about it. We've seen yellow flag, people bumping, tires getting cut. This is nothing new. Only all of a sudden are we now throwing penalty and freaking out all the time about it. Yeah, it's it's like what we've said before on this show several times. NASCAR is consistently inconsistent when it comes to officiating, especially when you consider the fact that there's been other instances of post-race contact, even this year, and they just let it go. I exactly. think about, about towards Richmond when Truex got into the back of Hamlin there, for example. Oh my God, that was awesome. That was awesome. And, and look, I'll be the first to admit, I didn't want Bubba getting fined. All I said was, if you fine and penalize Josevar, it's got to be on the table. But guess what? Chase Elliott and Suarez should be on the table. Yeah, it should. And that, In fact, and that went if nowhere. You're, if you're, yeah, I was going to say, if you're going to end up pen penalizing Bubba, then you should penalize Chase Elliott as well because the retaliatory contact that Elliott did against Suarez was close enough to pit road so that there could have been a bit of a risk oh. there. But they said that was a racing thing. Like, again, it, it's amazing how we just put other words to things to sell it to people. You know, kind of like, the whole Truex Hamlin thing was all because of the restart, right? And remember the conversation with Ben Kennedy? Oh, well, there's a gray area there. What? Since when? Well, there really isn't a gray area. We just decided that was the call to make. You know what? Then fine. Go back to having phantom cautions and ruling the race like you did 20 years ago because you're dues in the same criteria and you haven't made the show any better. All you've done is turn it into freaking chaos. Oh, let's get to the end of the race and then we'll just... Line them up and wreck them again. That, that's all NASCAR has been celebrating for the past probably two months now. How many of these races have gone from meh to good racing because we've had one or two late restarts? Or in the case of whatever event that was, five of them. Yeah, for, for real, man. It, it's just been... Sorry, I'm fired up. Yeah. <laughs> fired like up. I said, I think this lineup of stories we got today is just to make Rich very fired up. And in some ways, I, I'm a little bit fired up about it too, but not as much as you are. But you have a better, you do a better job of uh, controlling the chaos and using it as an outlet appropriately, and being able to play a little devil's advocate. I get over the top passionate, and I've been so frustrated with NASCAR over the recent time that I do, Sean. I literally want to drive down to NASCAR offices and be like, "Listen here, dumbkers." I don't know what your problem is, but you have done made things horrible because either greed, ignorance, stupidity, or laziness. So 
You figure it out, but I'm going to tell you where you're messing up, and you're going to tell me what your decisions are, and I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, and I'm going to bet my nutsack on it, and in six months when it happens, I'm going to come back and go, I told you so. So you better hire me because I'm going to get your shit figured out. I know I'm being a little cocky right now. You know what? I think we're going to have to start uh, throwing in the uh, whole uh, warnings like Jeff Manns does at One Man's Opinion if we're going to get on this level of fired up about it. Sorry. Yeah, we should probably have a disclaimer. (laughs) Warning, this is for if mature audiences only. Rich is NC-17 rated. (laughs) Well, it's rated R. We haven't hit NC-17 yet. Because it, it, let's just say we're not like Jeff we Vance close. during that one li- live stream. No, where he no, ended but, up going streaking. Let's put it that we way. were we, we were getting a little <laughs> bit close there a couple of times today, though. It, it, was, it was a little, it was a little dicey. <laughs> oh man, we're we're ha- having a we're having a little fun today on the Race Guru Thunder Hour. But you know what, though, uh, let's get right down to business, shall we? All right. Let's, let's get on. Let's get on into uh, the uh, DFS preview for DFS and betting preview for this week's races at Pocono. How about that? Sound good? That works. That works. Well, before I do that, can I give one paint scheme shout out? True. True. Let Let's go through the paint schemes real quick then. I, I want to give one shout out. Alex Bowman. It yeah. looks like the girliest. I probably just offended somebody with that. It looks like the girliest paint scheme of all time. But if you look closely, it's a bunch of paw prints. And it's a ode to pets, cats, dogs, rescues, that sort of thing. So I just want to give a shout out to that. Being the big dog lover that I am, I couldn't I couldn't give the shout out to this car, Sean. True. It's not a bad looking car. I actually uh, like like the unique theming of it because we don't usually see too many paint schemes like this with the paw prints in mind and actually have it kind of flow. It's a little bit busy. And uh, for that, it's not one of my main choices of the week. But I do think it's not a bad scheme in its own right, too. And I definitely see the appeal. I especially like how they have the number placement as well and worked with that. Oh, too. Good call out. I'll be frank. I would never want to drive this paint scheme. I would never design a paint scheme like this. I'm not sure I would even say I like it. I just, I, I appreciate it. It's what it's about and how they did it. This is a great way to draw more kids and women to the sport too, in my opinion, Sean. I mean, it's not just the colors people will appreciate. There's a little heartstring tugging here and him coming off a win. This kind of just works well, you know? And not to mention all the animal lovers, too. I, I mean, let's right. not get it twisted. Men, women, children, old, Very young. True. Very anybody true. can appreciate a good, good animal scheme. That's true. That's true. So I just wanted to do that. Sean, if you want to hit any of yours, go for it. Otherwise, we can get into the, uh, the DFS preview. All right. Let's just uh, quickly hit some of these paint schemes real quick then. Uh, let's go forth. I have Austin Dillon's Boot Barn paint scheme here. I really like this one a lot. Black and red, two colors that go very well together. You have that distinct number three that looks very much like an, it's ripped straight out of a Dale Sr. car, which I also really like. Do it for Dale! Too. Do it for Dale! <laughs> But yeah, very fast, very sleek looking paint scheme. I like that one a lot. Let's hit one of your picks here, Rich, that you have lined us up for today. Uh, The Ryan Blaney Wabash paint scheme there. He's actually ran this paint scheme as pictured before at Talladega earlier in the year, but he's bringing it back for Pocono. I, I love the blue and yellow overall, and it just flows very nicely. They got that whole gradient thing going on. Very clean ah, looking that's what scheme. you call it, gradient. Yes, gradient. I dig the gradient stuff, man. It it reminds me of the old DW17 Auto Parts car. Yeah, very, very cool looking car. Now, I get bought a few uh, other ones here, and this one's really uh, just a pair of teammates with some good looking paint schemes this week. I have Todd Gilliland's CH Reed car, and I have Michael McDowell's Gunk car. Both of these cars look pretty nice, pretty simple, but, you know, very effective and uh, like the usage of space. They're busy. Well, the Gillen one is a little bit busy, but it's busy in a nice way, whereas the McDowell scheme, it kind of reminds me of like the old school uh, game paint scheme that Mark Martin used to drive in the Xfinity race back in the day, but with blue and orange and the 
just yeah. the usage of colors is looking great. So there you go. I dig. I dig. So both of the front row motorsports drivers ended up having some good paint schemes. I paired them up today. Won't be the last time I'll pair them up within this show. That's a tease for later. <laughs> But, and then let's just also get this out of the way and have a brief conversation on this too. But what the heck is going on with Denny Hamlin's Mavis paint scheme this week? What the frick, man? I didn't like the old one. I, I find this one actually bothers me less, and maybe it's just because I like black better than white. I don't know. But I don't like the, the look, the Mavs, the tire. It looks like chintzy 70s kids artwork and this and is ugly like, to for, me it is ugly man it and you know ugly. what the, the part that bothers me the most is the white the white there because i know oh, they the were A-Pink. trying to get the fedex represented there but i feel like they should have just left that part black and just have it flow better because that white is so off-putting compared to the other mixture of colors that it it, it just turns me away from this scheme and we've seen the other mavis schemes where they don't do this heck heck i even made sure to bring him on for this show here this was the previous one that denny raced where it's white and blue i think this is a better looking paint scheme than that one and that was just the first time they changed it because we also have the the other paint scheme here which is the best looking one of the three this one looks good this one looks professional to me this one looks good the other two with whatever cartoonish tire Mavs. It it looks cheap and chintzy, man. I'm just, I'm out on it. Yeah. You know what? I'm just going to say this, but whoever designed it, they should get penalized for actions detrimental towards my graphic designer taste. I I, I support that. I support your stance on that. Do you, you like how I uh, segue that I with did. actions detrimental there? Cause it's Hamlin. I did. I did. <laughs> Well, you know, it's his podcast. He gets penalized for that stuff. Hey, I dig it. I dig it. Um, Well, this week we got Pocono. And Pocono is probably the most unique track we go to. I mean, you can say that about all the road courses, but there is no other track on the circuit. We have tri-ovals. We had quad ovals. We have some of these other semi-looking like triangle tracks. But this is truly a triangle track. And look, there's a debate. Is there three turns or is there six turns? Or five? People like to call it five because turn two is based off of one of the turns at Indianapolis. And we count Indianapolis as a four turn speedway with the short shoots between turns one and two and three and four. Turn one is based off of the old Trenton speedway, which is now defunct and doesn't exist out in New Jersey. And turn three is based off the Milwaukee mile, which the trucks are going back to again this year. IndyCar is going back to the Milwaukee mile. I'm glad to see the Milwaukee mile getting back in play because it's a, they need to do some upgrades around the track, but the track itself and the racing, it's its historic. It's been there a long time. It's a flat oval, flat bowl ring. It's good times. This is tough to set up a car. You have three very unique turns. We've always shifted at Pocono, or for the most part we have, um, largely due to the two long straightaways, Long Pond, and I can't remember what they call the other one, but the, the straightaway between one and two and the straightaway between three and one is massive. Both of them are very, very long. Um, so we've always had shifting. We'll have even more shifting. We'll, I'm guessing we'll see more than just four and fifth gear. We're probably going to see third gear in the turns at times is my guess. Um, they were still able to pass in years past. When I looked at the previous races, Sean, there was plenty of place differential points to chase. And when I say plenty, like one year we had three guys in the top six that all gained 20 plus positions. That's not including the whole rest of the field that had 10 here, 15 there, 14 like we saw from Kaz Grala, right? So um, it's true. It's going to be very unique, very interesting. Usually rain comes into play at some point. It's so massive. It's in the mountains in eastern Pennsylvania. It's about two and two and a half hours outside of New York City. We typically see some rain. It's usually not. I went back and double-checked. We don't really have a ton of race-shortened events, even though they don't have lights. What happens is we always seem to lose a corner of the track, right? Like that straightaway, they didn't. Do you remember when they didn't used to have the fence on that straightaway between one and two, and it was just the pine trees? And then Casey Kane wrecked up into the pine tree. That I was just, still I go, crazy. I know. I go back and look, and I'm thinking, 
it's so weird we never had a fence there. Like, there's no fans or anything, but it's so weird we never had a fence there, right? We've had some um, really bad crashes at Pocono oh. in the past before. Some have even, I'd say, been career-changing. You think about towards Jeff Gordon's crash. Yep. Where that He said that was the crash that basically started his whole history of back problems there. We, uh, You mentioned the Casey Kane crash right there, too. I want to also say, also, the... Uh, 2017 with Jimmy Johnson in particular was also a so, notable one too. It's very interesting you say that because today I was scanning through one of the social media sites and they specifically brought up that wreck and said the wreck that we think changed Jimmy Johnson's career. And they went through and it's like, you know what? He really was not the same after that. And I remember when Jeff had that wreck that day, he said, cause I believe the safer barriers were still relatively new at that time. Um, he was so thankful for the safer barriers, and he said, even with the safer barriers, that is the hardest hit I have ever taken in a race car. So you're not wrong. I mean, when you have the straightaways that you have here, they're pushing some serious speed on corner entry, right? And really, it, if the drivers hit it right, you come out of one, you hit that long straightaway. For a while there, and I don't know if we still are with this new car, you would just roll off the gas, dime in the corner, get back on the gas uh, after apex on exit and carry that speed down into to turn three, which you do have to break and really kind of, it's, it's a long radial turn. So there's plenty of room to miss and kind of ride the outside if you need to, but you got to get slowed down and get in that turn. It's easy to screw that up. And then when you come down out of three, that is a massive straightaway down the front stretch. Turn one is notoriously difficult. It is real easy to upset that car and back her into the wall. And that's what Jeff Gordon did. And it, if I had to guess, he was pushing 200 when he lost it. Yeah, he was. So, um, should be interesting. DFS wise, I'm not chasing dominators, Sean. I will chase place differential before dominators this week. We'll probably only have a handful of lap leaders, but Sean, there's not that many laps we run. Yeah, because this is one of the largest tracks in the Cup Series that the one of the largest tracks the Cup Series visits, we know that the lap count is going to be much lower than average compared to a lot of the other races that NASCAR visits. But also some other th- some other factor that we're going to have to watch out for too is pit strategy in particular. Oh, for sure. Because because the track is large enough, we've seen this sometimes in recent races where sometimes the leaders or drivers that are close to the lead will end up getting far ahead of the pack. Then when green flag pit stops come, they just safely go forth into their, the pits and then boom, they don't even lose a lap. They're, they're still remaining on the lead cycle overall. And that's something that I think could also come into play too, especially if we don't, don't get a lot of cautions in this race, but you know what they say about cautions, cautions, cautions breed other breed cautions. cautions. And, and historically, we haven't necessarily, we've always had some long green flag runs, and then we do tend to get a, a, a bundle of cautions at a time. And, and that's really because of the restarts, right? We don't go to too many places where it's like five, six, seven wide on the restart. We will here. We will get that. And turn one is notorious. Turn one here and turn one in Indy is historically the t- most difficult turns that the NASCAR drivers, even IndyCar drivers, because they've driven at both tracks too have called out as some of the most difficult turns, if not the most difficult turns in NASCAR. Indy, it seems weird because turn three and one are identical, except for vision. In turn one, you've got the stands, and so it's almost like a funnel, and it totally messes with your line of vision. Even playing on my video game, Sean, turn one in Indy for whatever reason. I can get in and, in and out of three, no problem. I screw up one so much. And at Pocono, it's even more difficult, I would argue. there's You can get through the turn, Getting through the turn with speed is difficult, and yes. you're right. We're going to see some, you know, cautions breed cautions. Look, there's plenty of room to pass. We're going to have plenty of green flag runs, right? You're spot on with the the fuel mileage. This has all whether it's been 400 or 500 miles, fuel mileage has always come into play. And now with the stage, it's even more so because with three to four laps to go in the stage, if you're at the tail end of the field, like you said, you pit, you pit. You get out in front of the lead lap car because you can do it without going a lap down. And then you get waved to the front when all the leaders comes into the pits. And if you saved enough fuel or have an extra long fuel line like Joey Logano, you're in the catbird seat. That's We've seen it a couple times this year where teams have gone forth and stayed out long just so they could catch a caution, put the field behind them. But that might not offer as much of an advantage this week. So... 
it all depends on where drivers run in relation to the leader. And that's something that we do have to keep in mind. And they'll, and, and look, they'll run this race backwards, right? The crew chiefs will, they're going to go, okay, we got to make our last pit stop between here and here to be able to make it right. And we may see, depending on tire wear, we may see two tire, no tire, something like that, depending at the end of a stage or something. But I'm with you, Sean. Fuel mileage strategy is going to be a significant factor, which is partially why we see such a you know wide range of place differential position moving up type of scenarios. Yeah, but also let's not keep let's not also discount the fact that the rivalry factor could come into play here this week, just be, like it was within the past two years of this race too. Particularly De- Denny Hamlin and Ross Chastain in 2022 when uh, Hamlin walled up Chastain. That ruined his day. And then we have to remember last year it was Hamlin and Larson. So in the, so, in the overview article, yeah. I said, I'm, I don't know if you saw the end of it there, but I said outright, I'm expecting a Hamlin-Larson show this weekend. I, I Look, anything can happen. I could very well be wrong. I'm not you know, betting my nuts on this one or anything. But I do believe based on how they've run lately – where the speed's at, the rivalry that's been going, the bumping that's already been going on, the fact that Denny is absolutely dominant at this track. I mean, the his numbers wins at this leader. Tra- Seven wins. The next most is Kyle Busch with four, who has two more starts than Denny, by the way. Out of 34 starts, 22 top tens, 18 top fives, seven wins. The percentages on that are mind-blowing. There's a handful. Larson and Elliott are a little bit better than 50% on top 10. Same with Truex, same with Kyle Busch. But for the most part, even Brad Keselowski, who's run well here, and Joey Logano, they're about a 50% top 10 finish rate. Denny Hamlin is 22 out of 34. He won his first two races here. Won four of his first eight races here. It is mind-blowing how good he's been. And Larson has just been fast everywhere. So I I am. I'm I'm on the hook, Sean. You can hold me to the fire. I think we get the Hamlin Larson show this weekend. Yeah, I do think that that's certainly going to come into play. And we'll get to that in in a second here when we go through our uh, driver's picks, our early driver picks, that is. I'm going to quickly review the part-time starts here for this week because we got quite a bit of interesting names here for trucks and Xfinity and Cup. Uh, for the uh, trucks, let's have you go through that here real quick. Give us the lowdown so, here. So we got Chris Wright hopping in the number one. We don't have a lot of history on Wright. He's a younger driver, but anytime you're hopping in a uh, Tricon truck, it's worth noting, especially that number one truck. They cycle through drivers. As I mentioned earlier, Connor Mozak is going to be in the Spire 7. Something I'd like to mention here, road racers tend to do well at this track. And I don't know if it's because of the high speed, high brink hard braking into some flat turns. The fact that you have to have the car set up so differently because of three different turns, but historically speaking, successful road racers have taken well to Pocono as an oval. Um, Going back to Tim Richmond back in the day, AJ Allmendinger has done well here, right? Um, So keep your eye on Connor Mozak and the number seven Spire truck. I don't have a lot of hope for Sage Karam in the 21, but he is worth noting. Um, Ross Chastain in the number 45, that's a big deal. He's already taken that same truck to victory lane. So take note of that because he does run well here. Zane Smith in the 91 is a big one for me. Um, he's going to be the teammate of uh, Ankrum and Eckes, and that team has had speed all year. So take note of him in the truck series. Look, Luke Finhaas surprised me and did a good job. He's in the 66 this week for Thor Sport. So don't necessarily count that out because as we've seen with um, Connor Jones, that truck can have speed and do well. A um, couple other names, Keith McGee in the 27, Brian Duzot in the 28. I'm not overly excited there. I am curious to see how Thad Moffitt does. It's the same 46. However, it's a new team. He lost yep. his ride in Young, who is, I, I would argue, a slightly better tier team, bought the truck and the ride and put Thad Moffitt in it. So let's see if Thad Moffitt bounced back because Thad's looked decent at times. It's not someone I'm like overly excited about, but for DFS purposes, a couple of years ago, he was on my radar. I'm hoping to see a little bit more from him, so that'll be fun to watch. Um, and finally, Justin Carroll, it, nothing that really moves the needle for me in the number 90. So I'll cover Xfinity here. We got Dawson Cram and Garrett Smithley in the two JD Motorsports Smithley cars. got pulled. Oh, uh, who's in the car now? They pulled the whole, they pulled the whole entry. Interesting. 
Well, then that means all the teams make the race if that as a result of that. Yeah. Let me let me because I just saw that right before we came on the show. I saw that he was not in the ride. So let me I'll let me continue. find go through your list. I'll get you the, the accurate info, Sean. All right. So we have Patrick Emerling and Mason Massey in the two SS Greenlight cars, the 07 and the 14, respectively. Josh Berry, as mentioned, is in the AM Racing number 15 in the Xfinity series. This is going to be one that we're going to have to watch, see how the the car does in practice, see how it does in qualifying. But I have my eye on that 15. As do I have oh, my eye on the uh, next four drivers on the list here. We have William Byron in the number 17 for Hendrick in the Xfinity series. We also know that Hendrick, whenever they entered that number 17 car in Xfinity, always a team to watch. Taylor Gray and Ryan Truex are the two Joe Gibbs racing ent entries in the 19 and the 20. Corey Heim is back with Sam Hunt racing in the number 26. Also going to be worth mentioning right there, of course. We have Stephen Malozzi making his Xfinity Series debut with Joey Gase Motorsports in the number 35. We had Jade Buford in the number 74 for Mike Harmon Racing. Not expecting much there. And then we have Josh Belicki in the number 92 for DGM Racing. So that could be an interesting potential pick for a mid for a value that could maybe place top 20 if the circumstances line up there rich yes and i can't find the article so he may very well be in it at that because when i read the article i was like oh okay so now everybody's gonna make the field so i'll have to find it for you i apologize i don't because now everything i'm finding they have him listed but even nascar's entry list doesn't get updated until after the fact yeah, but, you know, we do have three uh, part-time entries in the uh, Cup Series race this week. We have yes. Cody Ware back in the 15 for Rick Ware Racing, J.J. Yaley in the number 44 for NY Racing, and then probably the one, the only one really that we should care about is A.J. Allmendinger in the 16 Agreed. for Colleg. So Agreed. That That's already, we've mentioned it before, Allmendinger is a driver that we have to keep our eye on. Colleg. He did end up finishing top 20 in this exact car last year. So something that to consider right there, especially for the price point. Oh, he's cheap and he has run. Dinger has run very, very well um, here at Pocono over the history of it. So, I, uh, you know, props to uh, pops, to Mr. Dinger. And I'm glad to see him back in the car. He's run well in that car lately, man. I, I've been relatively impressed, to be honest with you. Indeed, a has of high. So, you know what? Let's get into our uh, driver picks here, our early picks. So, top price drivers to watch? Well, Rich is the one that usually says it, it almost every week, but here we overlap, so. Yep, we overlap. We overlap a whole bunch of times here. Yeah, but uh, we each pick the same three drivers. We both agree it's going to be a Hamlin Larson show, but we also do think that Tyler Reddick is going to be the one driver that could disrupt that equation, especially considering how strong Reddick has been at Pocono in recent years. I mean, you have to consider the fact that Reddick, he finished runner up in the last two Pocono races in the next gen car. He's going to be one to watch, especially when you see how strong that number 45 team has been running and how good 2311 is at this track overall. Yeah. Give me some Reddick there. He, he is definitely one of my favorite options well, this week. And, you know, Hamlin's the team owner there, and we just talked about how Tamlin is, like, ridiculously the most dominant driver, I mean, all time. I mean, it, it might be, might be, like, is that hyperbole if I say all time, Sean? Well, he does have the most wins all time, and, you know, he also has the most laps led of all the active drivers. So, I mean, there is a case that can be made. So... And you got to believe if I'm the team owner, my name's Denny Hamlin. I want my team running well there. Right. Exactly. So, you know, uh, we mentioned one of the 2311 drivers so far, far with Tyler Reddick. I mean, he's under 10 K on DraftKings, and then on FanDuel, he's 12,500. So for that price point, you know, uh, we're expecting compete for the win level of performance for a driver. That's not priced that compete for a win performance. So, 
something right. that, that we have to really, really keep our eye on there. See, I can't find it now, Sean, but it was a JD Motorsports number six car. They said they got pulled from the entry list. So I, I'll have to see if I can find it somewhere else, man. I apologize. Um, I mean, we'll get it figured out before race day, but I'm just pissed off. I can't find it now. I'm 100% with you on Reddick. I am 100% with you on 2311. I already told you I thought it was the Hamlin Larson show. So I am not. When I saw your list, I was not shocked. Not shocked. I could. I, I could. If you wanted me to have something different, for example, I could go Bell over Reddick. The only reason I would do that, body language matters to me. The fact that Reddick is so distraught right now leads me to believe that he feels like he's faking it, that the team is faking it from a speed standpoint. I got to believe, though, that, again, with Hamlin, his ownership and his knowledge and what he expects and, and all that, I, I got to believe that team bounces back this week. I could go Bell because I feel like they're due again. They've had so much speed, but I'm with you, man. Tyler Reddick can keep getting mad, but they just keep finishing races well, man. I just do think, though, that Reddick is the better call just based on price. And the fact of the matter is, is that with the intermediate rules package, and that's the package we're using in Cup this week, Reddick has displayed more overall speed across the mile and a half, for example, than Bell has on a consistent basis. Darlington's a perfect example. Yeah, he's been in the conversation to win almost most of those races involving the mile and a half package. And that's what we're using. So give me some well, Reddick right there. How did Reddick run at Charlotte? Because Bell was definitely the car to beat at Charlotte. I'd say that's probably the one track where Bell definitively really looked a lot faster. Fair enough. Um, mid-tier options. We definitely don't have a ton of overlap here. We're both on Josh Berry. I don't think... There's a shock there, Sean, right? Um, he's had decent success in his Xfinity runs. Also, the fact that he's driving for the number four team who's had good success here with Kevin Harvick and Rodney Childers. I think that's really kind of, for you and I, our selling point, right? Agreed. So he, he's in there. Um, you're on Alex Bowman. I don't, I don't hate that call, but give me some background on that. So when it comes to Alex Bowman, this is just based on the fact he is a former winner at this track, and he's actually been surprisingly not too bad in the last couple of races at Pocono. For the last five races, he's finished 11th or better. And for the price point, he's under 8K on DraftKings. And for FanDuel, his price point is still fairly approachable at a flat 9K. Definitely a driver that I like overall. And especially when you consider that 48 team, they consistently compete for top 10 finishes regardless of track type. So I think the price line is perfect for for Bowman there. Give me some of that 48 this week. Fair enough. Uh, I'm... Really, my logic for Chris Buescher, who is my next pick, is very much similar. Previous winner here. He Again, he showed speed at Darlington. He's shown speed at these bigger mile-and-a-half intermediate packages. RFK in general has shown good speed at just about everywhere. Buescher has a good solid history here, so I'm on Chris Buescher. He's a little more expensive. Um, I think he is just north of 8000 8600 I want to say. Um, so he's a little pricier, but uh, I still like Buescher a bit this week. Um I think Kyle Busch is a bargain, honestly. To go back to your uh, whole thing on Busher, he is more expensive than Bowman on DraftKings by 200, but he's actually cheaper than Bowman on FanDuel by a flat 1K. So he's 8K on FanDuel right there. Wow. So he's a super discount on FanDuel then. Yeah. And as for Kyle Busch, that, that's another driver I think is not a bad call overall, too. He finally got his first top 10 since a pretty much early May, which is crazy when we're talking about Kyle Busch here and how good he's been at the track. But And he's yeah. been fast. It's been, it's been incidents. It's been bad luck. It's been mechanical. It's been a bad race where they completely missed on the setup. I mean, it's been the whole gamut of reasons why, and it's not all been related to lack of speed. So given his history and his price point, I'm probably going to keep rolling the dice as long as the DFS books keep having him priced low. For me, it's going to be a little bit more qualifying dependent because we don't know. Sometimes these RCR cars have been a bit of a toss-up of whether they're going to show speed or not every week. 
because true, true story. When, when true they're story. on it, they are actually quite on it. You can get like a top ten result out of them, but when they are off, they are very, very, very off. off. And and look, Dylan's run well here too, so that's part of the reason I feel like they'll probably have a little more speed. They have had speed at times. It's not like they've been completely off everywhere. But you're right. When they're off, they aren't top twenty. They're thirtieth. You know. When Kyle Larson and Chase Elliott miss a little bit, they're 15, 20 speed. No, 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 no. At RCR, we're 30th place in speed. So you're right there. Sell me on Bubba Wallace, man, because outside of me wanting to smack him all the time, what do you got? So when it comes to Bubba, it goes back to the whole 2311 equation. They've been really, really fast at this track in recent years. Bubba has three straight finishes of 11th or better going into this week's race at Pocono at the site. And we have to remember, there's been a year or two when he actually had the speed capable to even win this race but just didn't because the pit crew fumbled it, but still came back to score a finish. He's led in two of the last three Pocono races. He, he scored positive place differential in about four of the last six races. He scored positive place differential. I like the 2311 speed on the mile and a half. While I don't think that Bubba is going to be as competitive as, say, Tyler Reddick is this week, I do think, though, if you were looking for a driver that's capable of top 10 speed that could maybe even potentially sneak into a top five if the circumstances go well, I think Bubba for the price point. He's 7,600 on DraftKings and 8,200 on FanDuel. Yeah, I like the price point enough to try it. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, Honestly, I like a lot of the sleeper bargain values this week. I could go any number of ways. Um, if I just needed to save money, there's a couple of punt options I'm not afraid of. If I'm looking to, you know, I've got money to spend. There's definitely some of the higher priced value guys that I think are worth a look. Look, you and I both love both the front row guys, Michael McDowell and Gillen. I think I lean Gillen over Michael McDowell this week, but we're as do I. Okay. So we're splitting hairs there. Um, I like Dinger at the price point, man. Um, the last couple of cup races, he's been a factor. He's been a top 10, top 15 guy. Top five, probably not, but I like him. Um, I want to like Stenhouse. I know you got Ricky Stenhouse, so sell me on it because I saw one top 10 in 20 tries, and I did not go back and look at all the history. He definitely ran well here last year. I want to cheer for Ricky Stenhouse, man. Like I said, I, I that, guy, that guy and his family was super nice to my family and everything at the go-kart tracks. I want to cheer for him and do well. I just didn't want my fandom to get in the way. So lay it on me for Stenhouse. So for Stenhouse, it's more so just the expectation based on the price point. He's 6,500 on DraftKings. And then when you're at that price, I expect you in order to score a top 20 result and maybe to sneak in the top 15. Stenhouse has done that in a lot of the recent Pocono races, actually. three Top 15 and three of the, uh, the last five Pocono races here. And he's also scored about uh, four... Five top 20 finishes, actually, within the last six Pocono races. So it is a little bit qualifying dependent because if he starts deeper in the field, like, say, around uh, 25th or so, I definitely would love to take a shot on that, too. Yeah. But I sure. think also to, because of the fact of the matter is, is that that 47 team has been sneakily getting some decent results fast. here and there. So they've been, they've been showing speed. It, you know, we were all worried that with the whole sponsor and the change that there was going to be a problem. They've rise to the occasion. I mean, they, they have consistently been res- better than respectable, I guess. You know what I mean? They don't deserve a name like the soccer club. They've been getting it done as a one car team. So hat tip. Um, yeah. I, just I like, like your Daniel Hemrick. Yeah. I love your Daniel Hemmer car call. He has been notoriously solid in Xfinity here. Like, just gets top tens in Xfinity all the time. Um, I love the Hemrick call. I, I think he can do it. I kind of like Cindric though, as a sneaky play. I understand he's already got a win. They haven't been the fastest, but both Brad, when they were at Penske, Joey, since he's been there, Blaney, since he's been there. Team Penske kind of has a little something figured out here at Pocono. Not shocking. I mean, they've run IndyCar here for years and everything else, so I'm sure – they probably have as much data as far as the track and speeds and all that as anybody out there. Um, but, you know, like I said, I there's a lot of ways we could go with this price tier, Sean. Yeah, Cindric is not one of my top picks overall just because – 
based on the history here, he's lost place differential in both of his Pocono starts. And that that does not put me really on Austin Sindrick for the price point as, as much as say, you know, give me Almondanger, give me Stenhouse or either the front row drivers. Or heck, you can even make a case for Daniel Hemrick, as mentioned, who has two top 15 finishes and two cup starts. Went back when he used to drive for RCR at this track. And Colleg, they did score a top 20 finish at this track last year with A.J. Allmendinger. He finished 17th. So that's the expectation that I'd like to put on for Hemrick, especially based on his Xfinity history. But as for Cindric, he's not somebody I really trust other than maybe for a tournament play oh, or something. It, it, I'm talking tournament, and it's more a gut shot. And another one I've got a gut shot on is Zane Smith. That one I can say I, I'm a little more in agreement with you there. I, I, and I'd his like price Zane. point is cheap, and he's 5800 So, I mean, you definitely have a lot of wiggle room if you went with Zane Smith. The Cindric one is more of a gut shot, man. It, it really is. I have a feeling he's going to get inside the top 15. It's just where I see it. Now, if he qualifies fifth, top 15 doesn't, I mean, it'll score and you he's points. He's done that the, both of the times say, at Pocono. It, right. And, you know, you take that minus 10 points, and now all of a sudden the 20 points you scored, 25 points you scored is now 15 points. You know what I mean? So I get where you're coming from, but that's he's still the name. I, I just got a feeling that, JGR, Hendrick, and Penske are going to be the ones we want to watch. Um, but really, Sean, to your point earlier, qualifying practice times will matter a lot with this group and tier. You know, if Zane Smith looks decent in practice and qualifies 33rd, I'm going to love him at 5,800. If Austin Cindric qualifies inside the top 10, yeah, I'm not going to be anywhere near as warm on that, right? Daniel Hamrick qualifies 28th. He's probably lock and load for me. He's cheap. He's probably going to finish inside the top 25, like clockwork, you know. So um, I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, as far as our bets go, we have a ton of overlap here. Hamlin at 4-1. to one, Larson at 5-1. to one, Tyler Reddick at 8.5-1. to one. If you wanted to hold a gun to my head, like I said earlier, and force me to go somewhere else, Christopher Bell at 7.5 for ones on my radar, but I'm like, Sean, they're so close for me. I think I'd rather get the extra one, you know, the hundred, the eight fifty to one or eight fifty plus eight fifty on Reddick than I would the seven fifty on Bell. If you wanted to bet Bell, really both of them, you could bet similar odds for a top five or something like that. Um, Agreed. You know, I really like the Ty Gibbs call. I think his line comes down, Sean. I, I wrote that up in the article at plus thirteen hundred. It's one of my favorite bets because I think after practice and qualifying. I won't be shocked if Ty Gibbs is plus a thousand or less. Yeah, I am a hundred percent in agreement with the, you there, Rich. Ty Gibbs, he finished fifth in this exact cup race one year ago, led some laps. He's now got another year of experience. He's shown he can be more consistent. That 54 team has shown a bit more speed on average this year. I like the Ty Gibbs call, especially a plus 1300 for the outright right there. I do think because we also have to remember, this is where he made his cup debut. And you know what they say about drivers when they go to the tracks for the first time and they have some sort of sentimental memory with it. They tend to perform he well. here pretty, pretty well. Well, and, and last year, this was kind of the starting point where he started to turn the page, right? To your point, he'd done his debut the year before, right? When they had the hit and miss starts here and there but this was the point last year where all of a sudden ty gibb many of us i don't know if you were but me and my buddy were disappointed up to this point then we got to this point and said look he's got to start showing us some or i'm starting to get concerned and he did and from this point on you saw that improvement in the cup series and that's partially why i'm as excited for him for this year because i think you're spot on with that take absolutely so so Ty Gibbs, he's definitely a driver I like. And as far as my long shot, I was considering between Bubba and Bowman, who are both at plus 3,000. I mean, that is – that both of those drivers should be a little higher for in my eyes. Bet but the, the top tens if you can get him instead, man. T take, yep. take those plus 3,000 odds. See if you can find some top 10 lines. If you can't, I'm not all about the top five lines, but I will take reduction in odds – to bet something on the top five lines, it's going to be tough for them to win. 
I would hate for them to be second or third when I knew I could profit off of it. Because if they win, I'm still profiting at the top five at those longer odds. That's how I would roll with it personally. But I love your long shot pick here, bro. Yeah, Josh Berry at plus 8,000. I think this makes the most sense. If you're really going to go super deep, try to hit somebody for an outright to be a surprise, I think it's Josh Berry. That number four team, Rodney Childers, they were a consistent top 10 competitor back when Kevin Harvick was driving this car. They've also mentioned before that Barry's running a lot of similar setups that Harvick used to run at, at with, with the tracks recently. So something to really keep in mind as well. I think the four team is going to have another strong week. And look, Barry's been on the cusp. There's been a couple of times this year where we're like, oh, it's the end of the race and Barry's in the top five and he's hunting. Like this looks promising. So I'm with you, Sean. Throw a buck on him at 80 to one. Throw two bucks on him at 80 to win and win 150 bucks. I mean. 160. Yeah, yeah. I'm rounding <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, well, I'm just saying, you know, throw something little on it like that and sit back and watch. I'd rather do that and bet like a top 10 on the Bowman's and Bubba's who I think are likely to at least finish there anyway and hope that they do finish better. You know what I mean? But I, at 80 to one, that Josh Berry odds, dare I say, is off. Yeah, I think it is for sure. Let's get into then, our DFS core fours. Go here. for it. Hit me. So I'm going to go fourth. Uh, it's the same between both sites this week. I got Tyler Reddick, 9,800 on DraftKings, 12,500 on FanDuel. Alex Bowman at 7,800 on DraftKings and 9,000 on FanDuel. Bubba Wallace at 7,600 on DraftKings and 8,200 on FanDuel. And Todd Gilland at 6,800 on DraftKings and 5,800 on FanDuel. Getting all four of these drivers into your lineup still leaves you with the ability to get say a Larson or a Hamlin in there and still get yourself a favorable pick. That's just above a six K. So you can have a nice rounded out lineup with just those four alone. So I went a little different Avenue, but I love Sean's approach here. Quite frankly, you could do a hybrid of what we're both doing here and it can work well. I just went to a far extreme. I like what Sean did leaving you some options. I am, I'm all in on Larson and Hamlin, and I'm going to probably live and die by that sword. So I went with Larson and Hamlin, which means I have to get creative elsewhere, okay? We're going Barry and Gilliland. Now, they're not the cheapest value plays. Barry's at 7,100. I think he's still a value at 7,100. Sean, I've already discussed Gilliland at 6,800. Now, depending what you do with your next two picks, you could go, say, to a Zane Smith at 5,800 and a Chris Busher. As one example, okay? Or you could go Bowman at 7,800, and I'm trying to think of who was right around 6,000. You might be able to get a Ricky Stenhouse in at that point. Um, or, or maybe Bubba even like Stenhouse. a Daniel Hemrick and then or get Daniel yourself Hemrick. a Ty Gibbs. Yes. yes. Oh, you know what? That's the way to do it. Daniel Hemrick and a Ty Gibbs. Now we're cooking with fire, man. Oh, my gosh. Hamlin, Larson, Gibbs, Gillen, Barry, Hem uh, sign me up, bro. I, I'm, in fact, I'm going to make notes. We're doing that lineup this week. <laughs> I'm not even joking. You know what? Let, let me see if we could plug that in right now. <laughs> you know, maybe we should start doing that. We should do one lineup on the show. We'll alternate. You do it one week. I'll do it one week. We'll split the money after we win or all that. Um, but maybe we should do that. Maybe we should change something and do do a section where we build a full lineup oh i think that man would be we're just short of that on dk are you serious a uh, literally a oh. hundred bucks away my favorite lineups are always a hundred bucks away sean always i'm always like just give me a hundred more but you know if you're in this position and wanted to do something different, a driver that I actually don't mind for this circumstance, if you wanted to just go above 8K, is Joey Logano, though. I like that. Oh, that's a sneaky call. I don't hate that call at all. Joey runs well here, man. Like he does. He just, he just like quite, even though he doesn't have a ton of top 10s and top 5s, I don't know how many times he's been like 11th, 12th, 13th. He's been in that top 15 range, the top 10, top five range always. Like, he just always seems to be in the hunt, man. Ah, dude, we're doing that. We got to find a way to start building a lineup on the show. Like, this would be fun. I think it'd be great for discussion. I don't know how we go about doing it, but we should figure this out. 
Well, we'll, um, we'll put thinking caps on for future reference, but we'll leave it at that there. Maybe, maybe we, you know, because we're going to have to take a two week hiatus, right? With the Olympics. Yes. I mean, we don't have to, but there's not going to be a lot to talk about, right? Maybe, maybe during that two week hiatus while I'm doing football and you're helping all of us on all the football stuff, maybe, maybe we come up with a new format for the show a little bit. Do some things to make life easier for you. Hmm. Potentially, we can think about that. All right. Well, hey, this has been the Race Guru Thunder Hour. I have not given enough shout-outs to FantasyGuru.com. I apologize. We ran long again today. My apologies for that. Sean tried to move us along, and I threw us back in with some paint schemes, so shame on me. Um, <laughs> please go to FantasyGuru.com. Click the subscribe button. Look, if, if you're not seeing what's working for you or what you want, or you do want the whole kit and caboodle, and that price scares you a little bit, but you have no problem with the football pricing, reach out to support at FantasyGuru.com. Tell them what you're looking for. You need to do this before the end of the month, though. Come August, man, I don't think we're going to have any special pricing because everybody and their brothers is going to be like, oh, crap, I need to sign up. Yeah, you should have signed up by now. So if you are if you love the NASCAR stuff, and we hope you do, $40 gets you all the NASCAR, all the MMA, all the PGA, NHL, NBA, everything but football and baseball, literally everything. With the betting, DFS, all of it, you just don't get baseball and football. I'm sure most of you love baseball and football. We love baseball and football. So we're all about that stuff. Reach out to support at fantasyguru.com. On behalf of Sean Angle and the Elite Plus Network and fantasyguru.com that allows us to talk NASCAR and racing, I am Rich Mileto. That is Sean Angle. You can find Sean on Twitter at SeanE247. That's S-E-A-N. And you can find me at Fantasy Bosco. Till next time. Peace.